Right, I just thought I'd start with a bit of the wonderful call of the curlew. Um, thank you all for joining. And um, yeah, I'm Mick Green. I've been doing working on curlew on and off for uh, 20 plus years, and quite a lot of it in surveys in Montgomeryshire, starting with some wind farm sites and then moving on to various others. So I'm going to go through uh, the sort of basic biology of the curlew. Um, some of the areas we know about in its distribution, some work I've been doing in Montgomeryshire itself. Um, we'll look at the threats and we'll look at some of the work that's being done to try and save this uh, magnificent bird. So as uh, Kerry said, um, if you have any questions, please ask them at the end or stick them in the chat box as we go. And I'll try and answer as many within the time at the end. Right, for some reason it's not, oh, we go. Um, but sort of worldwide basic ecology of the curlew, it breeds in the sort of upper part of the planet, sort of across North Asia, Russia, Northern Europe, uh, in the, what we call the boreal and temperate areas, preferring damp or wet areas generally, especially near water uh, as a fairly generalisation. It's an upland bird in Britain, breeding up to about 550 metres above sea level. And it's also a lowland bird. Generally, wherever it goes, prefers open landscapes, with wide visibility, away from woodlands, forests, ravines. Basically likes to be able to see out, see if any predators are approaching. So it likes open ground. After the breeding season, uh, the our curlews, Eurasian curlews, tend to shift towards the coast. Uh, Mudflats and sands especially, our estuaries and soft coasts where they feed on, on uh, invertebrates. And uh, then use the adjoining salt marshes, foreshores and uh, wet fields um, once the tides are in. Curlews are omnivorous, so they eat almost anything, but mainly invertebrates is their, their favoured prey. They're also very long-lived birds. They can live 20 or 30 years, which is actually quite important when we look at some of the, the later ecology and the threats, because it means we, we need to know what's going on over a long pe time period to see what's happening with their productivity and, and how they're faring. They're also, again, very important for their conservation. They're very, very site faithful. They return to the same few fields and breeding grounds. And then on the wintering grounds, they'll return to the same part of the same estuary every winter or the same beach and um, we'll, we'll see some maps to show they don't actually go very far at all around the breeding grounds or around the wintering grounds. Again they say the omnivorous worms are a favourite on um, soft pastures and you can see from that beak how deep they can probe they can use the whole of the beak to get uh, invertebrates deep into the soil. So in Wales, we find curlew in a very wide variety of habitats, from moorland through the moorland edge and down to the lowland pastures. In the pastures, they can also be found in a wide variety of fields, from the unimproved fields, often favouring wet areas where there's invertebrate feed for the chicks and for the adults. But even in, in intensive silage fields, they'll breed, try and breed almost everywhere. Obviously, silage cutting is a problem, and we'll come to that later. Curlews usually move up to the breeding grounds in March, so they'll be moving up in the next few weeks. Um, I'll be seeing the ones that are nesting on the Dovey Estuary next to where I live. They'll be moving away in the next few weeks. And you'll start to see them in Montgomeryshire in their breeding grounds quite soon. And when they first turn up, it's when they're quite vocal. They're setting up territories um, and they're fairly much easier to find when they're first there. So, and then they lay the eggs into April or early May. Um, the, the mean first egg, late, egg laying date in the UK um, is the 5th of May, although that's probably earlier now. That's from a paper that's about 20 years old. And as with climate change, many things are getting earlier. And certainly in Montgomery, sure, it's probably April, they'll be settling down on eggs. Clutches are usually of up to four eggs, four is the normal for the first clutch. Nest is a small scrape in the ground lined with grass. They're usually around 30 days for incubation. 
that's 30 days from the final egg. They only fully start incubating after the final egg is laid to try and get all the eggs hatching at the same time in the same sort of 24 hour period at the end. This is because the young are what is called nidifugus, that is they leave the nest immediately on hatching. So they'll, they'll be moving fairly quick after they've hatched. And they feed and fend for themselves, but overseen by the adults. The adults don't feed them directly, but they do follow them around, guard them from predators, herd them into decent places. So they do look after them, but the young more or less feed themselves. They'll feed on small insects because they've only got a small beak to start with. So off the surface, so little wet flushes and things like that are an important source of food for the chicks. They can't probe at the early days. It's another 30 days or more to fledgling when they can fly and they become more independent. They'll hang around the adults for a bit but eventually they'll become more independent and move off on their own. If the nest fails early in the season, if it's predated or for other reasons, uh, the birds will usually relay, although the, the relay clutch is quite often smaller, just two or three eggs quite often in the second clutch. If the nest fails late, once they're nearer hatching, the birds are less likely to, to relay. The birds usually start, depending whether they've been successful or not, they'll start to leave the breeding grounds in July, hang around, maybe roost at some inland sites, and then tend to move to the coastal sites, which is where most of our birds winter, although there are some wintering sites in, in Montgomery, places like Dolly Haverham, seem to have a few birds for the whole, all over the, all the year, non-breeding birds during the summer and wintering birds as well. So these are some of the, the habitats we find them in. It's a typical curlew nest in a very nice unimproved pasture. Again, very neat little nest, lovely coloured eggs in a, in a small scrape with a grass lining. It's a more rougher sort of moorland edge site. Again, there's a small nest in the middle of that with three eggs in. Uh, again, they're on the moorland edge rather than the rougher, the higher area. This is a rougher grass moor. Again, a small clutch there, again on the edge of the moorland, not near the trees, in open ground where they can see any predators coming. But they also nest in silage fields. And obviously as the, as the grass grows up, the nest slowly gets more and more hidden. And this can be a problem for rather thick vegetation for the young. Uh, it's not ideal for the young. And also obviously silage gets cut and often the nest or the young get cut up as well, so it's a problem. As I say, the movements we're slightly getting to know. There's been a lot of colouring done in Montgomeryshire by Tony Cross over the last few years. These are some of the recoveries. The orange sites are breeding birds that were ringed in Montgomeryshire quite often at Dolly Haverham. Uh, so they can see some of them have stayed and bred in Wales, in Montgomeryshire and North Wales. Some have moved up to Northern England and one up to the Scottish borders. And one outlier up top right, uh, one that was wintering in uh, Montgomeryshire and bred in Finland. The blue tags are wintering, records of wintering birds. Again, ringed on passage in autumn or spring as they pass through Montgomeryshire. And this is where they've ended up in the winter. Again, North Wales coast, up on the Mersey, uh, out to Ireland, um, and down to Cornwall, Devon, and France. The one that's on the French coast, that's turned up on the same beach for the last three winters. It's a colouring bird that, that a local bird has recorded and sent back details to us. And so, as I say, they, they're very site faithful, which can be seen on, on this slide. The, the different colours are different birds. These are radio tagged birds we've been studying on the Dovey estuary. Um, and you can see from the different colours of different birds, they don't even want their sight faithful to the one estuary, but even within the estuary they don't stray very far. The green bird here feeds out on the mud flats and then on the high tides it comes onto the same field and even the same part of the same field. 
The same with the red bird, it's feeding on the salt marsh and on the mud flat. And then on some of the high tides, it comes onto the same, just the one field and the same ones here. They don't stray very far at all, even within, within a fairly small estuary like the Dovey. This is the worldwide distribution of our curlew, the Eurasian curlew, as it's more widely known. The sort of darker brown up the top here is the breeding area, so right across Asia, Russia, Northern Europe, and into the UK and Ireland. The, the middling colour here is the where it's seen on passage and then the, the other sort of mucky brown is the wintering grounds and as you can see it's fairly coastal. A lot of the wintering grounds they seem to like the coast, it's milder, there's good feeding and um, so you can get them almost anywhere around the coast and here. I've been lucky enough to be out rigging waders in Oman down here and on the Amani coast, we tend to get slightly larger subspecies of the curlew, which are the ones that breed up in, in Siberia and northern Russia, come down what we call the West Asian flyway, coming down through here and, and breed, and sorry, winter down here and down in the African coast. Birds we get in, in Britain tend to be from mainland Europe or from up the north of Europe, and they come down across. One bird we know that was ringed in Germany, was satellite tagged in Germany last year. It came and stayed and staged on the wash and then spent the entire winter, last winter, in the middle of the dovey. Didn't stray off far like all the others. Another bird from the same ringing study in Germany went to southern Ireland and another one went and spent the winter in Bangor. So even though they were ringed in the same breeding ground, they seemed to go to different places around Europe, but always very site faithful and stay on the same part. In the UK, they're very much a sort of northern and western distribution. These are the maps from the various series of the BTO atlases over the years. Uh, the first one on the left is the atlas where birds were mapped between 1968 and 1972. As you can see, they're pretty common all the way across Ireland. And, and Wales. By 1988 to the 91 surveys, you can see Ireland has thinned out quite a lot. And we've also lost birds in South Wales and West Wales, in Pembrokeshire especially, and edge of Carmarthen. So we're starting to see a decline by 1991. And then the latest atlas, which is 2008 to 2011, the fieldwork, we can see we've absolute drastic decline in Ireland. Very, very thin distribution now. And the same in Wales, we're losing the west of Wales. We've lost a lot. Pembrokeshire is more or less gone, apart from a couple of pairs on Skoma, few pairs in Carmarthenshire, Ceredigi and one or two. Montgomeryshire, we've got, still got quite a few hanging around, which is nice, which we'll see later. But they have thinned out an awful lot. So a quick history in Wales. The historical atlas, uh, which was pulled together sort of details from a lot of the county avifaunas that were written by the Victorians. They described it as abundant in all of the North Wales counties and in Breconshire. And it was common elsewhere in Wales, except in Glamorgan and Pembrokeshire, where it wasn't recorded. There appears to be a general increase in the population across Europe around the start of the 20th century. And this was described as dramatic in the UK in the early part of the century. Curlews extended their breeding distribution from being mainland moorland birds, and they moved more into the lowland meadows. Uh, and we had some declines in the uplands, but they expanded more or less into the lowland fields. And at the time, this was a good idea, quite rich fields with haymaking, which was mainly done after the breeding season. Obviously, as we changed the silage, this became a problem with the birds. But as they're so scythe faithful, they came back and bred, but then aren't successful because of the silaging, which we'll see later. But um, so maybe that wasn't the best um, sort of evolutionary move. Um, so even by the 50s, there's some 
evidence of declines. And this increased by the time of, as we've seen from the 1991 atlas, losses in South and West Wales. And the species has been lost in Pembrokeshire from all the squares since 1968-72 atlas. And also we saw from the maps that the, the latest atlas shows further declines in the Western counties. And this is part of a general pattern of decline in the West and Western Scotland, Southwest England and the severe decline we saw in Ireland. And the Atlas text stated that the loss of breeding curlew from Ireland and parts of Western Britain is one of the key findings over the last 40 years. So it's a bit of a sorry picture, unfortunately, for the curlews. It is a, a slow decline for, for quite some time now. Generally, conservation status of the birds is not looking brilliant, unfortunately. We hold, we're very important for curlew in Britain. We hold a approximately a quarter of the global Eurasian curlew population. The estimates for whales currently from the last atlas range from 400 to 1700 pairs, which is a huge margin of error, just because they're so difficult to pin down and prove breeding, but it's probably somewhere in the middle of that. So we're probably talking about 800 to 1000 pairs spread across the whole of Wales, but it's quite patchy now, the distribution. National monitoring over the years through the uh, breeding bird survey and the uh, wintering birds survey, uh, the wetland bird survey by the BTO, show that this population has been in long-term decline since the 1970s. And the population of curlew in the UK as a whole was almost halved over the last 20 years. And in Wales, that's been a similar um, picture, only slightly higher. Obviously, we've seen that they're declining more in the West. The currently population in Wales is currently declining at a rate of about 6% a year. And many colonies breeding areas are on the verge of extinction. If the current rate continues, there's potential for a curlew to be extinct as a breeding bird by 2033, which is a rather sobering figure. And it means we do need urgent action to save these birds. We also support a lot of wintering curlew from mainland Europe. Again, there's been a decline of around 25% in the last 25 years. Many of our birds, as I said, are birds from continental Europe. So it's also very important we maintain our coastal wetlands and estuaries because they are vital for the conservation of Europe, European birds as a whole. Because of the European wide population declines, the curlew has been red listed by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as vulnerable to extinction in Europe. And globally, it's also considered as near threatened, which is the next, the next stage up as it were. So it's, it's not looking good across its range, but it's not gone far enough to despair as yet. We still can turn this around, but it's gonna take a lot of work. There used to be nine species of curlew in the world. We've also, also we have lost probably the one, the Eskimo curlew, which bred in Northern Canada and across the Arctic there has not been seen since 1963 in any definite sighting, and it's presumed extinct. This was very numerous. Losses were due to hunting, possibly climate change, possibly habitat change, but mainly hunting has seemed to be the loss of this. And once numbers get below a certain level, breeding is not so successful, birds don't get together so much. And, um, but again, because this bred in very remote areas and it was before the area of the era of intensive bird studies, we don't really know what caused the, the extinction of this species. Another species which hasn't been seen since definitely since 1998, there's been a few possible sightings since then, but none that have been 100% confirmed. So this is possibly extinct now. This one I find very sad. 
I've seen two Slender Bill Curlew in my life in the 80s and early 90s, one in Morocco, which was a regular site, and another in Oman. We think of extinction as something that happened in the past. This is a bird that has probably gone extinction within my professional lifetime, within the time I've been studying waders. And it's really sad to know that, that we weren't able to save that, despite quite a lot of effort. We hadn't a clue where it bred, it was somewhere in northern Russia. Nobody really ever pinned down the breeding grounds. The wintering grounds were spread widely across North Africa, Turkey, um, the Middle East, but there weren't any big concentrations. So we never really got to grips with this before it was too late. Um, we luckily know a lot about our curlew, the Eurasian curlew, but we really need to ensure that this doesn't meet the same fate as the other two species. We know enough to do things, it's whether we have the will and the resources to do this. So why are they declining? We're not 100% sure. Predation is certainly a big issue. Because they're long-lived birds, they've been coming back to the same sites year on year on year. But recent studies have shown that they're not producing any young. The young just aren't surviving. So although we're seeing birds back on the breeding ground and assuming they're breeding, once we start doing more intensive studies, we found out they're not actually producing young. And so as the older birds slowly die off, we're not recruiting new birds into the population. We don't know why predation appears to have gone up or whether the birds have just declined so much that predation is now an issue where they used to be able to survive it when they were in large numbers. The pie chart below shows the reasons for predation, the causes of predation from a study in, in Shropshire a few years ago over two seasons. On the left, the biggest culprit is the fox, the, the sort of orangey brown coming around anti-clockwise, the pale blue is badger. And then unknown, we don't know the losses. The pale green is the nest was deserted and we don't know why, but the nest was just abandoned and deserted. The next thinner segment is crows, which I was quite surprised at the fairly small amount of crows. I would have thought crows were more, uh, more of a threat than that. But um, obviously a lot less than the fox. And surprisingly, the final segment, the blue, is sheep. Uh, we've now discovered that sheep will eat curly eggs and deliberately go for them. We, we've got nest cams, nest cameras following them where the curly the sheep has actually come and kicked the bird off the nest and uh, taken the eggs. So keeping sheep out is, is one way of uh, maybe uh, helping curlew. Habitat loss has certainly been an issue over the years, drainage of fields, loss of damp corners of fields, uh, road building, housing estates, industrial estates, the general loss of habitats we've had over in sort of the intensively used landscape of Britain over the years. Probably not so much in Montgomeryshire, but certainly in other parts of the UK, habitat loss has been a big issue. Land use habit changes that are more subtle such as the move to silage has also been a big issue. Obviously in parts of Wales and certainly parts of Montgomeryshire, we've lost a lot of areas to afforestation. Places like Chambry Myers Moors were lost in the 1980s. Obviously, if you plant up an area, you lose all the curlew that bred there, but also the trees, harbour, foxes, crows, and the, Curlew won't nest that near to trees. They don't like being up against the forest. So you also sanitize an area around the forested areas uh, where you, you lose curlew breeding grounds. And so the sort of patchy nature of a lot of forestry in parts of Montgomeryshire means you're sanitizing grounds between the forests as well as losing the actual ground where you've planted the trees. So those are some of the areas. I'll say we don't know exactly why the declines have been so much in recent years, but that might just be because we're looking a lot more now than we used to. 
over the last few years, um, we had a, a conference in the Rollwash Showground in 2018, where over 130 people came together and agreed to pull together an action plan for curlew in Wales. This was finally published in November last year. We had a, the usual Zoom launch these days. Uh, Julie James, our Minister for Biodiversity and Climate Change, uh, helped launch it. And she has pledged government money to help the curlew, although none of it has appeared yet. We haven't had a penny yet from the Welsh Government, which is a bit disappointing. The Curlew Action Plan has been pulled together by a large group of people, which is nice to know there's lots of people that do care for Curlew. It's not only the usual suspects such as National Resources Wales, the Wildlife Trusts and RSPB, but also National Farmers Union, Farmers Union Wales, British Association for Shooting and Conservation, the Game and Wildlife Conservancy Trust, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, and the whole range, uh, the Gamekeepers Association. So there's a large number of people who like Curlew and have come together to produce this action plan. It's available online with a lot of resources, curlywales.org, fairly easy one to remember, and we'll try and um, uh, publicise all the links after the uh, after the talk as well. Having said that, it's great that we've got a very detailed action plan for the recovery of curlew in Wales, but at the moment it's just a plan and we vitally, really urgently need action to come from this. There's no shortage of keen people trying to do things, but we definitely desperately need resources. We desperately need Welsh Government to cough up. We also need other organisations to put their hands in their pockets and get things happening on the ground to work with the farmers, with the landowners, with everyone to um, save this, this wonderful bird. Some of the actions that are proposed by the plan. Surveys, although we showed all the maps from the atlases, we think we know where everything is. Once we get on the ground, it's really difficult to actually pin down individual pairs of curlew. I'll talk a bit more about surveys in a minute, but obviously we need to know where the curlew are to target action. We've got reasonable knowledge in a few areas of Wales. There's quite a lot of areas where we haven't done much dedicated survey. So yeah, to target the action, we can't target everywhere at the moment with limited resources. We looked at predation. Um, one way of reducing predation is to put an electric, find the nest, which takes a lot of time, but then put an electric fence around the nest to keep predators out. This has been done successfully in just over the border into Shropshire, a project called Curlew Country that's been running for a few years. They've drastically reduced the losses of curlew nests, curlew eggs to predators by electric fencing the nests. This is very labour intensive. Obviously, A, you have to find the nest. B, you have to find the landowner, get permission. C, you have to cut a strip, as you can see in the photo there, stream down the vegetation around the net around the fence so it doesn't short out on the vegetation and then you have to keep batteries changed keep batteries charged and keep the area strimmed for the month that the birds are on eggs curly will obviously leave the nest while you're putting nests up putting fences up uh, but they always nearly always come back um, because the the instinct is so strong to come back and we don't go actually out to the nest. It's a, roughly a 20 metre square around the nest that we, uh, we fence. So we hope to do that in Montgomeryshire. We've got a bit of money to buy the fencing. We haven't got any money to employ people to go and put it up yet, unfortunately. The other more drastic um, work that's being done in parts of East Anglia and in Curly Country in Shropshire is called head starting, basically captive breeding. Eggs are taken from the nest and the birds are raised in captivity. And you can see the cute little 
baby um, and Curly on the right hand picture. These are being cared for at the Warfowl Trust down at Slimbridge where they've got expertise in this sort of thing. Um, and then the birds, once they're fledged and can uh, fare for themselves, look after themselves, they're released back into suitable habitat where possible, where the eggs were taken, near where the eggs are taken from. So they're released where they can come back to their natal area because they'll come back. Um, as I said, the site faithful, they'll come back from where they're where they're used to. This is being done because although the nest protection with the electric fencing works very well, Curlew Country found that they were still getting very high losses of the fledged birds. The fledged birds were getting taken by, again, foxes, crows, buzzards, kites even. Um, so there was very high loss of the fledged birds. When they can't fly, they're easy pickings. They're fairly obvious as they're running around. And um, so all over the, the nests and the birds were hatched, once they start running around, they obviously leave the fenced area looking for food. And we were losing a lot of, of fledged birds. So head starting, although very really drastic, very labor intensive, very expensive, is possibly the only thing we can do for now to really start getting numbers back up properly. And it's been shown that the head starting is working. Birds, all the birds are coloring before they're released and they are being seen back in Montgomeryshire. There was one bird spent this, most of this winter that was released in Shropshire and spent this winter on Broadwater near Towin, just north of the Dovey. Other actions that are proposed because predation is such a big issue, predator control is one thing that we have to consider. It is being done on some sites in Wales and in Shropshire, uh, keeping crow numbers and fox numbers down. The actual evidence of whether we can do this enough to actually make a real difference isn't there at the moment. So it's something that's still being debated. But it's um, obviously gamekeepers think we should do it. Other people think we shouldn't because the evidence isn't there that it really makes a difference. But it is something we have to think about. And of course, habitat management are old, um, the old friend of conservation organisations. If we can put a few wet scrapes into the corner of fields to make it more friendly habitat for feeding curly chicks, that is something good. If we can not drain a field, if we can not cut silage, that's good. Some of the farmers in the curly country areas have been very helpful. They've delayed cutting silage, but they can't do that every year because the silage is not such good quality if you cut it late they lose silage quality, they lose feed quality and on intensive dairy farms where they need every bit of silage they can get. It's not viable in the long term for them to do that, unfortunately. But again, we are looking at working with the farming unions to work out other management techniques within silage areas. Part of the um, Curlew Action Plan was to bring together the information we do know about curlew distribution in Wales and areas where we know there are hotspots for curlew have been designated what we call important curlew areas or ICAs. As I say, this, this is going to change. This will be updated as we get more knowledge from more surveys. But at the moment, you can see from the map, the areas that are designated or have been so initially chosen as important curly areas where we will initially be targeting resources. Um, as you see, Montgomeryshire and North Radnor is one of the biggest. Partly we have quite good knowledge of some of the curly distribution. Partly we still have quite a lot of curly with the mixture of uplands, lowlands and the middling ground in between. Um, that merges over to the right into curly country in Shropshire. Then you've got the Berrowin, the Denby Moors, uh, here Ithog, up in uh, North Wales, numbers two and three. Up, uh, up here, this is round us, but even in North Wales, the head of the Colmy Valley. Uh, this is an area where the RSPB have European life funding and they're doing a lot of work on habitat management, uh, ditch blocking, rewetting areas of moorland and some predator control up there. And the, 
the Barrowin, number six here, the Barrowin is also an area where there's been lots of ditch blocking done over the years, re-wetting areas, um, because most of that's already designated an SSI and there's a lot of work gone on there over the years. So in Montgomeryshire we've done surveys, which I'll come to in a minute, but we haven't actually done much conservation work yet, um, but we are hoping to. Last year I obtained a small amount of money and we did a survey of Montgomeryshire for Curlew. There's been a survey that was done in 2012, which I did for, funded by CCW, as was. Um, but that was mainly targeted at upland areas because it was to look at curlew and wind farm interactions when there were quite a lot of proposed wind farms in, in Montgomeryshire. For last year, we put out a plea to Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust members for records. I spoke to the county recorder and various other people that I knew around the area, asking for curlew records. The Welsh Ornithological Society put out a plea for curlew records across the whole of Wales. Uh, and so it, it, this was a combination of targeting areas where we were given records, areas that I already knew from previous surveys, and as much as possible, just wandering around back lanes and footpaths. I didn't have access permissions for anywhere, so I could only go to areas that, where there was public access. But it was very successful. We found an awful lot more birds in lowland sites than I was aware of previously. There was a total of about 45 pairs we found sort of spread across the whole of Montgomeryshire. There's probably quite a lot more because there's lots of back lanes and tracks and things I didn't get down just because the area is too big. And it was mainly myself on my own with a bit of help from a few people such as Tony Cross. Um, but we have found more pairs than we knew uh, existed. Some of the upland sites, we have continuing to lose places. Um, places like Nantaraira, the valley through here, uh, 15 years ago held for 11 pairs. It's now got maybe one at the south end. Uh, again, we don't know why. There's no obvious habitat change up there. Um, but areas sort of around the sort of lowlands, semi-lowland, most of these are sheep pasture fields. So if we can fence the nests from the sheep, um, they should do all right because they're not, there's not that many silage fields in the, these are the upper slightly drier fields, uh, which are mainly pasture fields rather than silage, so they've got a chance there. Uh, there's a few, if anyone sent records and they're not on here, I do apologise because there are two or three that I've missed. There, are, there is a pair up here on the, above Dull Eye, um, on the, on the Dolva rather, on the road to Knighton Road, uh, which seems to have been missed off, off the map. So I need to update this map and make sure all, all the records are on. But um, we do rely a lot on people giving us records and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. As a quick aside, St. Baino is the patron saint of Curlew, which I didn't know until a few years ago. A person called Mary Colwell, who's done an awful lot of work on Curlew, uh, found this out. The illustration on the right is from a hospice in North Wales, illustrating the legend of St. Baino. But he's a Montgomeryshire lad. He comes from the area to the north of, of Carno and Kersus. Uh, there are churches dedicated to him at Better's Kedwine and the Beru. Um, and his Saints Day, April the 21st, has now been designated by Mary and others working on Curlew as World Curlew Day. So on World Curlew Day on the 21st of April, we celebrate everything about the Curlew, publicise it at the start of the breeding season and try and um, get some interest in conservation of Curlew. The legend is that St. Bueno um, moved from, from Montgomeryshire up to North Wales. He was in Bangor for a bit and then moved out to a small retreat and he had a small chapel on the north of the Fleen. And one day he was out in his boat and he dropped his Bible overboard and the passing curlew kindly picked it up from him for him and dropped it back in his boat. So 
he then blessed the curlew and made it almost invisible on its breeding grounds, grounds to protect it. So the reason we can't find curlew nests very easily is, is Baino's fault. But uh, so that's a nice little story, but it, it is a strong link with curlew to Montgomery Show, which is really nice. So that's the fantastic bird that's curlew. Um, what are we going to do? How do we find them? Um, with difficulty. Um, they're very sneaky. And they're quite difficult to survey, which is odd because they're very vocal. You hear them, but it's actually very difficult to pin down actually into numbers of pairs and actually finding the nest is, is very labour intensive. There isn't any one sort of one size fits all survey method. It depends on the aims of the survey. Are you trying to find as many pairs as possible? Are you trying to pin down individual pairs? Are you trying to find nests? Are you trying to work out productivity from nests? So it depends what the aim of your survey is, how you go about it. it depends on the habitats you're in. Obviously open moorland, you walk wide space transects, sort of random wandering around on the smaller lowland enclosed fields, you have to use different different methods. And on the area you're covering, are you trying to cover the whole of Montgomeryshire or are you just covering your local patch? Having said that, all records are useful at the moment. Um, if you see a curlew, please write it down. Uh, the more we know, the more we can target conservation work in the future. If you're out and about, walking the dog, bird watching, or just going for a wander. If you can sort of try and systematically walk all the lanes and footpaths in your area and just note any curlew seen on a map or with an ag accurate grid reference, and I'll, I'll put a link to how to find a grid reference easily on the information sheet I'll produce after this talk. But it's, as I say, the, the last survey I did, I relied very much on people telling me where they heard curlews near their house. And it's a very good way of us finding more curlews. It's really useful to record the number of birds and the behaviour. Are they calling? Are they alarming? And more of what these sound like in a minute. Are they just flying over? In which case, which direction they're going to and from? Are they sitting in a field looking as if they're looking at home, feeling at home? Um, all of these sort of information helps us pin down and get a picture of, of what curlew are doing. If you are out and about, if you are a farmer or a landowner, or if you're talking to your, your neighbouring landowners, have a chat with them, ask them if they've seen curlew, and ask for permission. Ask if would they be happy for curlew people like myself to come along and look for them, maybe fence the nest, that sort of thing. The more contacts we can have with, with landowners, the better for us. If you can send all records to, hopefully, curlew at montwt.co.uk. We haven't got this up and working yet, but we hope to. So uh, watch this space and uh, we'll try and let everyone know and it will be on the Montgomery Mitchell Wildlife Trust website. So hopefully there'll be a central core. What I would ideally like also, if anyone would like to volunteer, is someone to monitor that website and note down all the records we get into one place. So that would be great if somebody would like to volunteer to do that in the future. We did have a funding application in place last year to set up a volunteer network and to employ someone to go and help find Curlew. After we've submitted it, NRW suddenly turned around and told us that they were only gonna fund capital grants, not people. It's people on the ground we really need that funding application is still there if the money suddenly appears from somewhere. So watch this space and we'll let you know, because it'd be really great to get people trained and up and out, keep an eye out for Curlew. There is a survey toolkit available on land. Uh, it's at curlewales.org, which is also where you'll find the Curlew Action Plan and a lot of links to other Curlew websites, and general good information on Curlew. And again, we'll put this on a sort of information leaflet. 
on the Montgomery Trust, Trust website um, sometime soon. I'm now going to try and hopefully this will work. These are some of the calls. So the bubbling call, the typical curly call we hear. This is the, the, the flight call, the general song of Curlew. So that's the general tells you call. That's the area they just to say, I'm a curlew, I'm here. The next one, if it will work. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah. Pardon my. Uh, Technology. Yeah, there we go. Again, there are links to these on the Curly Wales website. So um, you have to excuse my mid Wales broadband speeds. Right, we'll forget that. Uh, try this one. No. Okay, well, uh, rather than just sit and stare at the screen, the other two calls are the there's a, a cautionary alarm call, which is the call you all hear if you're generally in the area or there's crows in the area or something like that. And then there's very agitated, so kick, 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 it's like call, which is used when the young or the nests are threatened. And that's a good way of finding whether they actually hatch young. If you see crows flying over and you get this loud alarm call. Um, so I'll have one last go at getting that going. There we go. Okay, so that's the, the calls. I'm sure that they weren't that loud on, on the on the audio here, but they are available on the Curly Calls website. And again, there's more descriptions on that about how to see them, how to hear them, and various things like that. As I mentioned, but the, the calls are quite important because you tend to hear them before you see them. And so the, the general call we all know, the um, That's the song, that's the call that tells you you're in a nice place and tells you the curly present. And then the alarm call will tell you that they're nesting. Um, so that's a useful one to know as well. As I mentioned uh, 
looking at the earlier maps, there's been quite a lot of colouring curlew. We've colouring over 50 on the Dovey this winter. Uh, Tony Cross and his uh, colleagues at the Midwells Ring Group have ringed over 130, I think, in Shropshire and Montgomeryshire over the last few winters. So we've got quite a few colouring curlew hanging around. The ones from Montgomeryshire or Mid Wales generally have got this colour combination on. Orange on the right leg, yellow on the left leg, and the yellow one has an individual two-letter code on. If you see any of those, please let us know. If you register them either on the Curlew at Montgomery Trust site, or if you register them on the Midwells Ring Group site, which is on the screen below, um, that's a really dinky little app. That if once you register the individual details of the curlew colorings you've seen, it'll tell you exactly where it was ringed and where else it has been seen. So you get all the information back immediately from the Midwest Ringing Group. However, I have to say, I've been looking at, we've got 50 on the Dovey, as I said, I've been finding the colouring birds, but I found it impossible to read that tiny little ring there. So for those of you that do photographs down telescopes, if you photograph it and then we can blow it up, that's great. But I do say even a record of a colouring bird, even if you can't read the letter code, is useful just so we know they're around and maybe we can get somebody out to try and find it, or even though Tony and I say we, we have great difficulty getting close enough to actually read the rings. Uh, but when they do pose, um, it's really useful to tracking movements without having to retrap the birds. And they are seen, as I say, they are seen away on the wintering grounds and on the breeding grounds. So we get sort of pan-European sightings of these birds to, to, to track their sightings. So yes, please, any sightings you see, let us know. We're hoping to colouring a lot more this year as well. That's about it for further information. As I say, curlywales.org has lots of information. Um, as I say, I'll, I'll talk to Kerry afterwards. We'll try and put a, a little information sheet up on the Montgomeryshire Trust website with these links and um, we'll confirm when the curlew at Montgomery Trust uh, email is up and running, if it is. And again, I request any sightings and volunteer to coordinate sightings if anyone is keen. Um, just before we go to questions, I'd like to say thanks to Kerry and the Trust for organising the talk. Uh, Tony Cross for lots of information and provided the images. The Ecology Matters Trust funded my survey and the Montgomery Trust members gave me a lot of sightings last year. So thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. And Kerry, if you can collate the questions that have been coming in, please. OK, um, so not a huge amount of questions through the um, chat yet. Um, but I have got a couple of um, questions from Kate. Um, so, so there's one very interesting one. Uh, so a solar park application and potentially a wind turbine near Lanard Lois is going to planning. Uh, it looks like it's at the old uh, landfill site. Um, it's about half hectare site. Curlews have been seen in the area. They've been recorded there. So um, obviously they'll have to carry out a, an environmental impact assessment, but how can we ensure that Karis Planning Department has the up-to-date knowledge to take the threat of extinction to curlew seriously? It's a really good question. That is a very good question because it's something that we've been having problems with. As you obviously know, the, the application for a, uh, the, the cemetery and um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, crematorium. Crematorium, thank you. Yeah. Uh, site um, near, near uh, Jesus Carno. There's also curlew on that site, and we've had a real difficulty getting the fact there are curlew there into the system. NRW, we're still pushing NRW, but they don't raise the issues of curlew presence. They only raise the issue of protected sites or European protected species even though that curlew are much more of a pressing conservation issue than any European 
listed species. Um, so I'll be sending the curlew map, I'll remind myself to do that, to power planners, uh, because certainly the, the area around the tip, around uh, the there is, there's certainly a good half dozen pairs in the general area around there, which is an important curlew area. So yeah, we do need to make sure that the planners are aware of the importance of curlew. The curlew Cymru group are currently talking of, well, we, I've drafted a letter on their behalf that is going to all planners, the head of planning departments, pointing out the importance of curlew, the fact they're threatened with extinction and asking them to take account or telling them that under the Environment Wales Act, they are a list of species listed of being of principal biodiversity importance, use the jargon, and they have a duty to take account of them. So yeah, we will be pressing that, but if other people, if you are making comments on planning applications, please do um, mention curlew and point out that they are listed on the Environment Wales Act as birds of importance. They are heading towards extinction and they need to be a material impact on, on, in curlew in, in planning applications. Okay, brilliant, thanks Nick. Um, Kate also um, would like to know if there's anything that she can do. She has approximately three hectares of steep field at around 1100 feet. Uh, it's currently grazed by sheep most of the year from May 2023, she's got the ability to make some adjustments to help curlews. So uh, is there anything that Kate can do personally on her land that may help curlews? Generally, they like the flatter land rather than steep land, but they will feed on, on any areas. Um, so again, any if you've got little damp patches, keep them or dig them out a bit to make sure little damp areas for, for birds in general and frogs and amphibians and you know it's good for wildlife generally keeping little flushes going. Um, again if you find curlew there or um, let us know and if you're willing for us to come on the land and fence a nest <laughs> we'll try and do it but um, yeah generally it'll be habitat and looking at keeping damp corners in fields and things like that. Uh, without without seeing exactly where it is and how it fits into the landscape I can't be more specific on that but um so I, I do know the site um I was thinking it would be more about providing um sort of feeding areas I think because because they are very site faithful for breeding grounds I think if they're not already there then they're not likely to start breeding there but I think um I think definitely um, providing uh, scrapes and, and things like that, which I know Kate is prepared to do. That's great. Um, I think, yeah, I think that sort of providing they, those feeding areas would be... Yeah, because really they do easy. travel quite widely to feel, feed. There's been some work done in uh, North Wales up in here, I thought, uh, well, on, on the, uh, the Aspati the, the Life Project, where they've been, again, uh, satellite tracking the curlews. And they don't sit in one nice neat little territory they'll they'll have their favorite field a kilometer away and another favorite mm. field a kilometer in the other direction so they do range quite widely and have their favorite field so yeah, anywhere we can provide feeding grounds that's great excellent okay um that that's all i've got for questions okay. has anybody else got any more questions okay kate's got a hand up again so um if you want to unmute yourself kate Kate, you're on mute. Did you want to ask a question? Oh, no, she says no. She <laughs> Has anybody else got any um, questions? Oh, she was putting her thumbs up. Sorry, okay. that was, Thanks, I uh, misunderstood <laughs> that. <laughs> No, no questions. Oh, uh, Ben, uh, Ben's from Biz. So yeah, he says it's really important to record all sightings of curlew so yes, that the I records have... are available to the planning department. And I will be sending my records to Biz as well. Um, so they're, they're in one central place. And I need to talk to Biz about 
collating records from the, the whole of the important curly area as well. That would be useful. Um, I just haven't had time to get around to it recently. Did you want to say something, Ben? Hi, thanks, Terry. Hi, thanks for that talk, Mick. Really interesting and nice to see what's um, going on in the north of Powitz. I'm probably down down here in Brecon, so don't get, get up there. But yeah, it's definitely um, very important to record sighting. So that they appear on the, the map kind of thing and that kind of evidence is needed in that decision making process and when planning ecologists the the data, you know, it's, they call it data. So uh, yeah. And yeah, uh, regarding the project Mick, yeah, get in touch and then we can see what the best way is for you to get the records to us. Um, and Simon, who I can see is in the talk. Hi Simon. Um, he's the county record as well. So um, yes, I've got I've got Simon's email address, and again, it's on my list of, of things to do. Yeah, so um, kind of collaboratively, yeah, we can get the records and make them available to you as well. I guess as well. I know Simon should be able to see them, but um, yeah, we can kind of figure something out and make the best of what we've got, and um, hopefully try and get more as well. And yeah, start actually doing something on the ground, hopefully for the curve. That would be great, and. Yes, just encouraging recording from everybody. And obviously, you're the first port call as at Biz for the, the county ecologists usually, aren't you? So yeah. if, it's in, if it's in your system, it's more likely to get through to, to them. Yeah, and every week we get a list of all the planning applications in Powers and we assign the wildlife record information and other information on habitat and things to them. So, yeah, really important to put the curl on the map. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Margaret Allen um, is asking if we want records from sightings in Shropshire too. So are you yes. interested in those, Mick? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a meeting with Curly Country on Friday uh, at Amanda Perkins, and we're looking at cross-border cooperation and sharing records. So yeah, any, any records we get for Shropshire, I'll pass them on to Curly Country, or there's another group with... Um, in, in North and North Shropshire as well. So there's, there's two groups in Shropshire that are, are working on curlies, so we can we can pass records on. Okay. Um, Paul is asking, do you use sightings, um, sighting data recorded on bird track? We haven't done, but I have requested it. Um, the Russian Orthological Society, who, who we're working with, is a partner of bird track, um, but they were rather busy last year because they were producing the Birds of Wales book, <laughs> which has finally come out. And it's a wonderful book. I recommend it. It's fun. a great volume. But um, uh, yes, I, I need to chase that up as well. As I say, because I'm I'm doing this in my spare time, everything takes a bit of time, but uh, like, like all of us. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, we, we, we hope to get, for, for all the curlew, important curlew areas, we're working with, with BTO and RSPB to try and collate all records, including bird track and BBS and, and things like that. Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, Audrey. Um, sorry, Simon, did you want to say something? Oh, hello, Kerry. Hello, everyone. Hi, Simon. I just wanted to mention that um, there's a group also the, of Curlew Watchers uh, organised by Leo Smith in the Church Stoke area. I, are you aware of them, Mick? Yes, I'm in touch with Leo as well. Yeah. yeah. And Leo has got a, a a meeting, a live meeting at the Horse and Jockey Pub, 7.30 p.m. on the 15th of March. Um, for anyone who wants to find out more about surveying curlews in the Churchstoke area, he's got a few spare tetrads, I think, that still need surveyors. So 15th of March, Horse and Jockey, Churchstoke. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Um, okay, Audrey, you have your hands up. Don't forget you are currently muted. That's it. Brilliant. Hi, it was a question from Deborah. Um, I noted the area on the map in Anglesey and I know Anglesey Council have done lots to um, rewild their wetland area. How many pairs of curlew are in that 
specific area, do you know? I don't off the top of my head, I'm afraid. That's an area which is part of the same study that's going on on the Dovey for wintering curlew. And it's mainly the Kevney Valley, the Mass Trith, the RSPB Reserve, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the Kevney wetlands up there that the curlew are being studied on. Um, but I don't know exact numbers of breeding pairs up there, I'm afraid. But okay. um, if you are, uh, a person called Rachel Taylor at BTO is leading that, that area, and um, or RSPB at Mashtrith, or uh, what's it called now? Causalaga, they call it now. Um, at the RSPB reserve will be able to tell you more on that site. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Deborah. Okay, and um, Daisy? Um, how much nest protection will you be able to do in our area? We don't know at the moment. Um, we've probably got a budget to buy enough nest uh, uh, fencing for up to 10 nests, but we haven't got anyone to actually do the work as yet. So um, we're still looking for funding for that or for volunteers to do it. But as I say, it's very time consuming because finding the nest, finding the landowner and actually doing the work. So um, it's a work in progress and we will do as much as we can. Thank you, Josie. Um, OK, uh, Kate has suggested perhaps uh, writing to our local MSs as well to make them aware of the situation with um, Curlews just Put the pressure on a little bit i think that's quite a good um, suggestion i think that is a great idea we're lucky with curlew that they have what's called species champions in the senate and various um, members of senate volunteer to be a, a champion the curlew champion is a chap called mark isherwood who's a ms for northeast wales but he's been incredibly active and very very good uh, he asked a question in the Senate last month um, to the minister, Julie James, saying what funding was going to be available, given that there's only a few weeks left towards the start of the season. And she did come back with a very lukewarm response, unfortunately, saying they're doing as much as they can, but there was no promises in it. Whereas she replied to a letter to us last year and she was much more enthusiastic. So I suspect she's been sort of trodden on by the Treasury. Um, but yes, any letters to your MS pointing out that they're going to be extinct if we don't do anything very quickly. And we do need money from Welsh Government. Welsh Government does have a duty under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the Environment Wales Act to preserve resilient ecosystems of which curlew are a vital part. So yes, any, any pressure on Welsh Government will be great just to remind them. Okay, and Margaret says there is a brilliant book called Curly Moon by Mary Colwell. Do you know of any more good reads? Not so much on Curly, no, Curly Moon is great. Mary has been absolute, the, she set up the meeting in um, the Royal Welsh Airground that started all this off in Wales, or, or, coalesce the various groups that are working in, on Curlew in Wales to produce the action plan so, and she still leads the, the English initiative. Um, no, there's one other book um, called Orison for a Curlew which is about looking looking for the Slenderbill Curlew across Europe and it's not wasn't the best of books but I don't know of any other books specifically on Curlew, no. Okay, um, Okay. that's all the questions I've got here at the moment. Has anybody else got anything they would like to ask? Yeah, Daisy's got her hand up again. Uh, what's the success rate when fences are used? On the Shropshire ones, I was, I was talking to one of their fencing people uh, last week, and it's quite high to actually protect the eggs but as I say unfortunately once the young are active and have, have um, hatched they do disperse away from the fence and tend to get predated 
So we still have very high predation on the young post hatching, but actually uh, it, it gives them a better chance because it, it does up the nest success, hatching success a lot. And, and it, it keeps most predators and certainly sheep off. Um, but um, we're still having very low productivity of, of the birds getting predated once they've fledged. Okay, anybody else? Again, there's, there's a, within the, the curly whales, uh, website. There's a link to the Curly Country website, which has all the details of the, the head starting and the, the success rate and that pie chart with the predators and reports like that. There's a lot of background information from, from Curly Country that's been going about five years now. They're, they're a bit ahead of us. Yeah, so over the next week or so, we'll work together uh, on putting a page up on the website, as Nick has suggested. There'll be a, a curly page that you can go and visit on the Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust page. And uh, that'll include links to, to various uh, resources and other projects so that you can see what's going on. Um, and we'll get that email up for sending record uh, sightings to. Um, Daisy, you're correct on that? Yeah, Daisy says there's, there's a I, book I, called I, The Last of the Curlews by Fred Bodsworth about the life of the last Eskimo curlew. She says it's fictional but interesting. I, I do have that on my bookcase and I'd completely forgotten about it, so thanks for that, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, brilliant. Um, so obviously this has been um, recorded. It will go up on the Wildlife Trust YouTube channel uh, shortly. Um, so you'll be able to come back and, and review it uh, whenever you like and obviously share it amongst other people. There does appear to have been quite a few people that signed up but didn't make it this evening. So uh, it will be available for anybody who would like to watch it. Um, so thank you very much, Mick. That was really interesting. Um, I hope you've uh, you've all learned something about curlews tonight and I hope you are future curlew recorders and that we yes. get lots of uh, sightings over the, the coming weeks. I, I have to say I'm really excited to hear the calls again. It's for me, it's absolutely when spring is here, when I hear the first curlews flying over the house. So that's a really exciting time for me. So really looking forward to that. So, yeah, thank you all very much.